All right, welcome back to the channel. Today I'm gonna to go over the absolutely essential ports that you need to know for home networking. Now keep in mind, this isn't gonna cover every single port that is out there, but if you're just doing stuff inside of a down and dirty home lab, something quick and simple, this will give you a really good grasp of all the ports that are used, what they're used for, and some considerations that you need to have for these ports as well. So let's go ahead and get started. So I'm gonna work my way down the line here, starting from left and going to the right. Now this first one here is uh, ports 21 and 23, and these are uh, used for file transfer protocol. Now typically what you would use these for uh, would be like if you had a remote, let's say something remote set up where you wanted to pull files off of, download or upload stuff. Uh, something I used to use back in the day when I was a web developer is for example, with WordPress sites, for example, is you would typically need to be able to go in and uh, access files on there. So these typically, if you're not gonna use this stuff, like if you're not gonna use file transfer protocol or any of the other stuff that I talked about, I'll give the exceptions to things that you need to keep an eye on. Then typically what you wanna do is go ahead and just close it down because if you keep it open, you're just increasing your attack surface by having this stuff uh, being allowed on your network. So in this case, like if you didn't need WordPress or you didn't need FTP for any reason, it wouldn't be a bad idea to just go ahead and shut both of these ports down. Now this next one is DNS. I probably should have labeled these ahead of time instead of making people guess what these are. So this is DNS here and that your DNS resolvers traffic goes over port 53. Now this is something that has to be allowed. You can't have this blocked or basically your internet will just refuse to work. You'd go to your web browser and nothing's going to happen. Now this next one here, this is where it's going to take a little more time to uh, cover this stuff. So let's talk about the what you would see like when you're using uh, a web connection, for example, you're trying to go to a website. Now, the ports that use this are ports 80 and 443. Now, port 80 is an uns it's considered unsafe now, and, and all the browsers should block you. So port 80 is for HTTP tra uh, transfer. Now, all the browsers should block you from being able to even use this. There should be some sort of a warning coming up if you try to visit a website that doesn't have uh, HTTPS enabled, like they don't have an SSL certificate or whatever's going on, but you should always have encrypted traffic. And take basically any browser that's out there, for example, what you should be able to do is just go into the settings and force an HTTPS connection over everything. Now this doesn't mean that you should block it because every now and then you will see it's once in a great blue moon, you'll see something legitimate use port 80, but the problem is, is like I said, it's all unencrypted. You wanna make sure that all of your stuff is encrypted and that's going to be what port 443 is for, which is your HTTPS. Now let's go ahead and pull up Portmaster here real quick. You could use any, basically any sort of monitoring thing. You could use like Wireshark or whatever. I'm just using Portmaster because I've already got it installed here. Now you can take a look at basically anything on here, all these connections and see if you come over here to uh, where it's got this connection info, you can see it's using port 443. So that means everything is encrypted. Now, like I said, there may be times where you see port 80 being used, but it should never be for anything essential. And it should really, it's really gonna be super limited. So let me give you an example of something that you could keep an eye out for. Now. I use Obsidian for note taking, which I'll do a video on this at some point in the future. Super awesome piece of software. Now this has cloud sync. Now let's say you're doing anything sensitive, you're, you're using some sort of an app and data is being uploaded and downloaded. Everything should be encrypted. So let's say you go to your, your firewall here and you see, okay, like let's say Obsidian, and Obsidian doesn't do this, I'm just using this as an example. Let's say you see your, your traffic being uploaded and you're using some sort of an app that says, oh yeah, our, we have secure technology and all that stuff. But then everything's getting uploaded over port 80 is you can be like, okay, well, that's a lie. 
it's not encrypted. So that's an example of some things that when you drill down deeper into this stuff of things that you wanna be on the lookout for, like I said, there's nothing wrong with Obsidian. I'm just using this as an example here. Now, the other thing I'm gonna talk about with HTTP is you'll use it for things other than, than just web browsing. So for example, typically you'll see VPNs use this in, in some, some fashion or another. For example, if you use the OpenVPN protocol or the WireGuard protocol, you could set it up over different ports. It's gonna depend on who the VPN provider is, but a lot of times they will have the option to use port 443. So you can send all of your VPN traffic over HTTPS. There's there's ups and upsides and downsides to everything, but that's just uh, one thing you'll see. But like I said, it should also always be on. And then the other thing I'm gonna talk about, so this, comes down to uh, because people are you're probably watching this because you want to know how to configure firewalls what ports should be open and closed all that kind of thing so let's talk real quick about one other aspect of port 443 and, and https traffic is deep packet inspection and certificate authorities now if you're using something like and you'd, you'd have to have a pretty fancy home lab setup to be using this stuff because you'd have to sh shell out a lot of money for it or you or would have to come across a great deal on eBay, but you could use something like Cisco or Palo Alto and download. There, I could do a whole video talking about this stuff, how it works, but you could do deep packet inspection on port 443 traffic. Now there's upsides and downsides to doing this. Basically what you're having to do is a man in the middle attack in order to be able to inspect everything that's coming into your network. So DPI basically, you could look at it as a man in the middle attack. Another example of this would be a lot of people like using third party antivirus suite. So things like Kaspersky or Sophos. And a lot of times those, those software suites will install things that will allow them to see if websites are malicious. And what the, the reason that they're able to do that because port 443 is encrypted and so nothing can actually read it, but what they have to do in that case is install a root certificate. So for example, what a third party antivirus suite will do is it will install certificates for that browser to use, which allows it to do basically a man in the middle attack. It, it's not for anything nefarious, but it, that's what it has to do in order to be able to read traffic coming out of port 443. Now there's some privacy considerations with that if you do end up doing that. And the other thing is if you set up a firewall on your router and you wanna do DPI and it does have the ability because some deep packet inspection, some of them don't work with HTTPS. They can, they can snoop through other stuff like port 80 and make sure everything coming through there is good. But some of them do have the ability to look through traffic that's coming through port 443. And there's other considerations, like if you're gonna set that up through your router, that's gonna be a separate video for another time because there's a lot of detail covered in that. Typically where you run into that, just in case anyone's wondering, and I'm gonna move on here in a second. Typically where you run into that is things like a government or business environment where they need to scan through all of the traffic on the network, but there's important uh, considerations that need to be made before you decide to go down that route and do something like that. So I think we've covered the HTTPS stuff pretty well. So let's move on to the email protocols. Now there's three different types of protocols. I'll break these down real quick so people know what they are and then we'll talk about the ports. So you have three different email protocols. You have the uh, simple mail transfer protocol. You have the, which is your SMTP. Then you have POP3, let me redo that. Then you have POP3, which is your post office protocol. And then you have your internet message access protocol. Now let's break down these ports. So SMTP is what you use to send email. So when you send an email, it's going over uh, one of these ports here, which I'll discuss these in a second. And when you receive email, depending on how you have your email client set up, that could be Microsoft Outlook, it could be Microsoft Thunderbird or, or Mozilla Thunderbird, whatever it is that you wanna use, SMTP is used for sending emails, POP3 and IMAP are used for incoming email. POP3 is what you use if you wanna download your emails locally onto your machine. 
and IMAP is what you use if you want to do basically the uh, cloud access, meaning you just want to access the emails that are on the server, but you don't want them downloaded on your computer. Now, when it comes to the ports, there are important things to keep in mind here. I don't know what the hell's going on with my pin right now. So port 25 and 26, you should not be seeing traffic going over these ports. These are considered unsecure. They're unencrypted, as well as port 110 and port 143. So when you're setting up, let's say you, you're watching this video and you're like, okay, well, I wanna set up my firewall uh, for ports or, or you just wanna know more or let's say you're working on taking your A plus or NAT plus or whatever the case. Ports 465 and 587, typically with SMTP, what you'll end up seeing is port 587 with POP3 and IMAP, it should be 995 and 983. Those four ports are encrypted. And there's a lot of, the thing with emails, there's already a lot of security problems with email. There's a reason why apps like Signal are picking up so much popularity. I don't particularly care for uh, using email these days, unless it's just for something casual, if you're doing any sort of serious stuff. The other thing you could do if you're gonna go that route, again, it's a separate video, but you could do something like set up PGP, but there's a lot of stuff involved with that. And like I said, that would take a whole video on its own. So I think I've covered email pretty well. So now we're going to move over to, I'll just say remote access for now. There's a couple different ports here. Now port 3389 is what you'll see in Windows. And this is for remote desktop protocol. Let's say, I don't really know of any case of people, unless you have like a really elaborate home lab or for some reason you just wanna be able to access your home Windows computer from a different location, that's where you'd wanna have the RDP port open, which is port 3389. But if you're not going to use it, then what I would recommend is if you have it set up that Windows feature installed in your computer, I would recommend just turning it off. And I would also just recommend if you're not going to use RDP at all, you can just go ahead and uh, block this port from accessing internet traffic. Now the other one is port 22. And what this is used for is uh, SSH. Now, if, if you're watching this video, you probably do some home lab stuff. You're probably more in tune with like tech and, and do more stuff. But here's where, if you're not, here's an example of uh, where this would come in handy. So let's say, and, and this is really popular with things with like Linux, when people set up uh, Linux servers. But let's say, because ZFS is such an amazing file system, let's say you're using FreeBSD. You wanna set up a FreeBSD server and use it as a NAS or something like that. And you wanna be able to log into the computer from basically anywhere and do administration tasks to it or whatever the case. That's where you'd wanna have port 22 open. That's, again, that's what you use for SSH. Now, as there's a whole lot of security considerations that you have to keep in mind if you're gonna use SSH. Basically, if you're not going to use it, then you should have that all closed up on whatever machine you're using and you should have the port closed down. But that is something that is going to vary depending on the person's, how a person's got all their stuff set up. So that covers, that covers the essentials. And this, like I said, this is for home networking, because if you get into a business environment or a government environment, there's a whole lot of other stuff you have to take into consideration because like I've got written up here, there's 65,000 uh, total ports, around 40,000, it's either 40 or 45,000, somewhere in that number, are used for various things. And then there's stuff that you can use for uh, miscellaneous stuff and, and set it up that way. So if I were to make a video going over all of the other common ports that you would see in like a government or business environment, I mean, the video would go on all day trying to explain all this stuff and all that. This is basically for home users to have to be able to reference be able to quickly reference what they're going to see for ports. And when you're setting, like setting up a firewall or when you're looking at your network activity, like on Wireshark or Portmaster or whatever piece of software you use or whatever your router is and you're looking at network activity, it's important to know what all the ports are. So that way it gives you a better idea of, okay, 
if you see port 53, it's like, oh, okay, well that's DNS traffic. Or if you see like port 587, okay, well that's SMTP. That way it, it helps you interpret what it is that you're looking at on the network activity screen, because that's a really important, also a really important part to see if there's anything odd going on in your network, or you know maybe you've got an attacker, or you're noticing some suspicious activity, and you need to be able to dial down on it. So what I'm going to be doing in the future, I'm gonna cover a lot of networking stuff in the future. I'm gonna be going over things like subnetting. I still have the OpenSense and PFSense build guides on the way. I wanted to get those done. I wanted to get those done like early this month or, or last month. It just, I'm, I'm trying to get all this other stuff done first because when I do the build guides for those, I mean, it's that's gonna take a lot of time and, and uh, effort to get those set up. So I'm gonna be revisiting home network stuff at a later date. I'm gonna be covering it more depth. I'm also going to cover more of the firewalls, setting up firewalls, setting up routers, uh, configuring them to be secure, things you need to keep in mind when you're setting up or, or blocking stuff, setting up like intrusion prevention systems, doing deep packet inspection, I'm doing root certificates or all that stuff. There's, there's a lot of great content coming in the future it just like i said it's it's a matter of me being able to get enough time to be able to make all this content and be able to focus on my work which ultimately has to come first i have to get all my work done before i can think about doing content because i'm not trying to be a full-time youtuber I'm, I'm basically doing this for fun and so yeah anyway that's gonna wrap the video up if you made it this far shout out to you that's great I appreciate the support as always, and with all that being said, I will see you on Friday.